All right, good evening, everybody. We're here for the, we're here for the fire station uh, first public outreach meeting. Thank you all for coming. Uh, just a little brief outline of what we're gonna go over tonight. We'll do some quick introductions, talk about some of the goals of this meeting. Uh, I'll give a quick general finance overview. Uh, the fire chief will give a short presentation about the need for a new station. And then our architects who are here will also give a short presentation with our preliminary plans uh, and designs. And then most importantly, we'll open it up to you uh, for any questions and answers that you might have. So to start with introductions, I'm Doug Lapp. I'm the town administrator here in town. Uh, with us is Fire Chief Duffy uh, sitting in the front row. Uh, next are our architects from Schwartz Silver, uh, Kelsey Sky Laser, and Stuart Marshall. And also we have a, a number of members of our, uh, our fire station building committee with us. Uh, we have uh, Lieutenant Charlie Williams uh, right here, Recreation Director Gene Blaney uh, out in the back, uh, James Killinger, our retired fire chief, and Christopher uh, DiFilippo. Uh, and so I wanna, there's other members that are on the committee as well, but we're not able to attend tonight. Some of the goals that I hope to go over uh, to help you understand a little bit about uh, what we believe is the need for a new fire station, the need for a new building, understand a little bit about project financing, what some of our options are and are not. Again, we'll go over some of those preliminary site plans from the architect, and then again, most importantly, to give you all an opportunity to ask questions and provide us with your input. So a brief overview, I'm just gonna say very few words here. I'm not just gonna read the slide, but we need a new fire station. It's just too small and too old, and the site is inadequate. And when the chief gives uh, his, his portion of the presentation, he'll go into that uh, in a lot more detail. As far as uh, funding goes for this feasibility study, this initial phase that we're doing, uh, we funded this from a small portion of our American Rescue Plan Act funds also known as ARPA, which you may have heard about in the news. Those are federal funds uh, that came down to cities and towns uh, to help communities um, deal with the economic impact associated with the pandemic. As far as financing the construction of a new building, uh, and I know that's something that's probably high on your list of questions and concerns. Unfortunately, uh, grants to construct new fire stations simply don't exist. Um, this is something we've looked at and we will continue to look at and we will certainly pursue any grant opportunity that's available. But if you look at what other communities have done uh, throughout the Commonwealth, um, they're not funded from grants. And if you look at the state programs for schools through the Mass School Building Authority or for construction of new libraries through the Mass Board of Library Commissioners, those are established state programs with a funding source to help communities uh, construct buildings. For example, our new school right next door that we're building, we're probably getting 40, 45% at least in a, a state match. Unfortunately, those programs just don't exist for fire stations or for any public safety building for that matter. Um, various bills have been pending for a long time, both nationally and in the state house to create those types of programs and the Mass Municipal Association and the Town Manager Association has been advocating for years for these types of programs, but the state legislature has not identified a funding source and they've simply not done it yet. So unfortunately, we are looking at local funding to construct a new fire station. Very briefly, just going over the town budget, just so people have a sense of context about where our money comes from and where it goes and what our ability is to fund a new fire station. You can see that uh, over, half of our, uh, over half our revenue comes from property taxes, and the next biggest chunk is from state aid. So just pr local property taxes and state aid comprise about 80% of all our revenue coming in and then you can see local receipts and debt exclusions. As far as where our money goes, what, what we spend our money on, the biggest single area is obviously education, and I should note that that education wedge and that pie chart does include um, the vocational school and, and some other smaller aspects. It's not just the Rockland School District, but it's predominantly the Rockland School District. Education is really more than that 42%. You know, A good chunk of our benefits goes for schools. Um, a good chunk of the property and liability insurance and even a small portion of the general government budget where we fund all the utilities includes schools as well. But again, you can see where you know, our money's going towards schools, public safety benefits, you can see all those categories. Um, there's just simply no capacity within our budget to fund something as significant as a new fire station. So what that leaves us with 
is a debt exclusion. And I know some of you are probably very familiar with it. The town just did that to construct the new school um, that's, that's nearly completed right next door. Um, but just as a quick refresher, uh, a debt exclusion is something allowed under state law, under Prop 2 and a half, that allows the community to raise the amount that it taxes for a specific purpose where there's going to be borrowing and debt service. But the key thing to remember with a debt exclusion is that tax increase is not forever. It's only for the life of the bond. Once the bonds are fully paid off, that tax increase goes away. So it's, it's, a, it's a temporary increase, unlike an override, which is a permanent increase to taxes to fund operations. So for example, if we were going to leave our current station, hypothetically, if we were going to leave our current station and build a new fire substation, we would have to staff that with additional personnel. And in order to fund additional personnel, that would be an override to fund those recurring expenses because those are going to go on forever. So this is a debt exclusion. It's a temporary increase. And it requires, as you recall from the school building project, both a ballot vote at an election and a vote at town meeting. It requires both to pass, a ballot and town meeting. So re related to financing and our ability to borrow, we have a very good bond rating. We've maintained our AA stable bond, ra bond rating with Standard & Poor's. And this is really good. I mean, you can see from the chart on the right, this is the scale that S&P uses. And we're very close to the top. There's uh, a certain number of steps that we'd have to take, <clears throat> which we're not quite ready to be able to accomplish yet to get to AAA status. But AA stable is very good. The better your bond rating, the lower your financing costs are, and then the lower, lower the cost is for taxpayers. So I know a question many people have, what could this new fire station cost? I want to stress. We do not have any firm cost estimates yet. We're very early in the process. But just to give a, a sense of scale or a sense of perspective, a hypothetical $20 million project would be roughly a $156 year increase for an average house. And an average house right now is around $446,000. There's a number of assumptions here. This includes a 3% interest rate in a 30-year term. But it just gives you uh, a sense of scale of what a roughly 20 million project um, could cost an average house. So a home valued greater than 446 would have a higher impact, and a, a home valued lower than that would have a lower impact. As far as next steps, um, if, and I want to stress this is a big if, this project has to be approved by voters in order to proceed. Uh, so if it were to proceed, if voters approve this, uh, under state law, we're required to do the design, bid, build um, method, which would be uh, the town would hire next uh, independent owner's project manager. That's someone separate from the architect and separate from the contractor, someone that represents the town's interest to make sure the project proceeds on time and on budget. The architect would then finalize their design and create their construction documents. We'd go out to bid. Uh, we then select the winning bidder and construction would be overseen by the project manager and the architect. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Duffy. He's going to show some photos and talk a little bit about the need for a new building. Thanks, Doug. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, the weather's horrible, so I, I appreciate everyone here. Um, and and ho hopefully, um, you know, you're here to support this project, or at least that's my hope. So thank you. That's how I'm going to look at it, positive, right? So currently, the current fire station that's at 360 Union Street is um, there's been a fire station there since the 1800s. Um, on the left side in the yellow, that was where the original fire station was, 1939, um, under federal grant um, project. The, the new fire or the old side of the fire station was constructed, uh, three bays with some living space up above. 40, uh, 40 years after that, in 1978, um, an addition was put on for another three bays as the department and as the town grew. Um, that station there takes up the whole site. I think we'll see a, a photo of that later. But that left-hand side was also built with federal funds. So the last time that the town actually paid to have a fire station constructed was possibly back in the 1800s. Um, we're not too sure on exactly what that cost was. Um, 
Next slide, please. Um, as you can see here, here is the, the, the fire station site along with the library site. Um, fire station takes up almost all of the property. Um, our property line runs right along the back here and then obviously out to Union Street. Right when they did the sidewalks so probably about eight, nine years ago, they extended our front ramp, this, uh, this uh, our driveway essentially for the apparatus. Um, we still, even with that extension, we still cannot pull the trucks all the way out onto Union Street in order to train, work on them, um, just do you know, just do a regular truck check. Parking, parking for the fire station is extremely limited, limited to this here, to this portion here, <clears throat> for on-duty staff, which currently uh, on-duty staff we have seven personnel per shift. Uh, they're on for 24 hours. And then on top of that, you have the deputy fire chief, <clears throat> the fire chief, and the executive assistant, who are our day staff, you know, business hours. So we have to cram all, all that parking into here. Uh, often we'll try and line the, the back driveway here with, with personnel parking. But if we have to get the apparatus that's in the back of the station out, we have to all move vehicles. So it's, it's kind of tough to keep um, this back parking lot too full. Um, also, the site really doesn't accommodate any training, any site for, for training. If we were to do, you know, hose training or ladder training, um, you know, we're trying to do it along the front or the rear, but it just doesn't accommodate, you know, a, a full large scale type of, of training that we, we would like to do. <clears throat> the next is the interior of the station. So this is the rear of the station on the old side. Uh, this is our ready room area. This is the area where the firefighters will congregate uh, in the mornings. They'll pass along oncoming um, shift. We'll meet with the uh, offgoing shift. They'll discuss what went on, what equipment's broken, what, what equipment needs to be looked at for the day. Um, this uh, is also our breakfast table, lunch table, sometimes the dinner table. Um, right out in the middle of the open of the apparatus bays, um, one of the big concerns with, with that is we've learned a lot in the past 100 years with firefighters that firefighting has been labeled a, a, a carcinogen. It's, it's, it's a cancer-causing um, occupation. And part of that is the diesel fumes, the chemicals, but just the, the, the smoke, soot, and chemicals that come back with us on the fire trucks, on our gear, on, on our, our hoses and equipment. So our, our table is all out in the middle. Even though we wash everything and we try to decontaminate everything as best we can, it's still, um, there's still some contaminants there, off-gassing. Trucks pulling in and out. We have diesel capture systems that capture the diesel from the trucks, the diesel exhaust. That still lingers in the air, not as often much as it did prior to the installation of the capture systems. But again, your firefighters are eating, lunch, dinner, they are waiting for calls. They are training. They are, are um, they're in a, in, a, in a toxic atmosphere. Um, so I think this is, you know, that's probably the, the, the big, one of the big reasons why we need to really invest in a new fire station is just for the occupational health of the personnel working. Uh, bedroom areas, the bunk room areas. Firefighters um, are on duty 24 hours a day. Um, so part of that, they do have sleep periods that they are allowed. Um, bunk rooms uh, are, are, are situated one on, there's, there's one on the, the new side, it's a large bunk room, sleeps about 12 to 14 uh, firefighters. There's another one on the other side that's large, and that sleeps probably another 10 firefighters. And then there are four smaller private bunk rooms for officers and senior personnel, and they, they sleep another eight firefighters. You get a big gang bunk room like this, um, and what we found out was, um, you know, there's a sense of camaraderie and, and family here, yet when COVID and a pandemic hits, you can't be, you can't have that type. So we were really scrambling, you know, we had people sleeping all over the fire, all over the fire station just to separate themselves, social distance. Um, recently, in this past year, we've hired two female firefighters. Um, great step for the town of Rockland. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's still a, a male-dominated uh, workforce in Rockland. 
So we had to make accommodations for the, the female personnel, the female uh, firefighters that are now working with us. Um, we were able to accomplish that with some, just some basic cubicle petitions, business cubicle petitions. Good thing is that they're, 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 they're great uh, firefighters, they understand, and they're, they're working with us, and um, they felt those, you know, those accommodations were over and above what they, what they were coming from, from their other um, employment. Uh, so, one thing that's not happening is apparatus is not getting any smaller, and the fire station isn't getting any bigger. Um, as we back the vehicles in, so this is again on the old side, new side isn't much better, it's a little bit better, <clears throat> but on the old side, as we back the trucks in, we have about two and a half feet of space between the truck and the lockers. So if your locker is anywhere in here, you're literally sidestepping to get to it, to get to your equipment um, at, on the, on the uh, your change of shift. Also, what's at, what happens if any of this gear happens to tumble out or is misplaced or somebody doesn't put it away properly, there's the threat of, of vehicles rolling over it um, and crushing it, damaging equipment, which is obviously has a cost um, associated with it. Uh, again, going back to the diesel exhaust from the vehicles, as much as we use the, the diesel capture systems and as much as we clean the equipment coming in off the trucks, this turnout gear, this, this firefighting gear, is open to contaminants, to gain, gather contaminants. Um, there's proven studies that the dirtier the fire year, the less effective it is during a fire to protect us. So, um, you know, it's important, and the firefighters are great about, you know, cleaning their gear. Now, what happens with dirty gear? We go to a fire. Fires now, are, they're not fires like they were back in the 60s and 70s when it was, you know, cotton fibers and fabrics and, and wood furniture. It is now, everything is pretty much a solid gasoline, chemicals, plastics, and when they burn, they burn extremely toxic. If you look at fires from that are occurring on the news today, back to fires in the 70s and 80s, you'll see that the smoke is a lot darker, thicker, it's much more toxic. That smoke gets embedded in, in our fire gear. We come back, the first thing the firefighters do, uh, they wash the gear. We have special washing machines that we've purchased through state grants to wash our gear. Um, even though we wash that gear, that gear will still off-gas some of the chemicals. So as you see, open locker designs all throughout the station, all that gear is still off-gassing a little bit of chemicals into the atmosphere. Um, same air that you know the firefighters are breathing as they're working around the apparatus of training, and also the same, same um, atmosphere that visitors and uh, people doing business with us at the fire station are breathing. So that's another thing that a new design of a fire station would limit the areas and section off many of the areas throughout uh, the station where any type of contaminated um, atmosphere is vented specially. Doug? Locker room. Locker room, as you can see, lockers of different sizes. It's right outside that ready room on the back side of the station. Um, this is our main locker room. This is not a bathroom to be had um, near this locker room. A lot of the firefighters, you know, they have to keep their toiletries, uniforms in their lockers in through here. So if they were to shower, they would have to come downstairs, get their toiletries, go back upstairs to shower, bring them back, change the uniforms. Um, yes, we do have some bureaus and some lockers upstairs, uh, the senior firefighters and, the, and some of the fire officers, the, the um, they have closets, but they, it's few, they, there's very limited uh, storage space for personal items. This is our kitchen. I think this is the best. I, don't, I think we re really re need to bring this over to the new fire station. Um, <laughs> this is our Brady Bunch fire station, uh, fire kitchen. Um, it's a beautiful shade of orange. Um, and really, I would say it's... I would say there's more space within this table in right, right along here than we have in our kitchen. And you know, we, we have firefighters, we have a couple members of the department here that uh, one of them who actually likes to cook, 
and they're trying to prepare meals for you know seven firefighters, often eight or nine, if um, the deputy fire chief Charlie or myself join them. So they're trying to prepare prepare meals for for everybody um, in this kitchen. It's it's really inadequate, but I think we should really keep the the, the color for the new station. Next slide. Um, so as you can see, this is looking on Union Street. Here's the apparatus. Uh, partially pulled out. It's as far as we can pull the apparatus out onto the front apron ramp. Um, you can see that there's, there's really no room for training. Uh, even if we just pulled one of the vehicles out, the back end of the truck is still stuck in the station. So, uh, and another major concern in really public safety uh, hazard that we have is anybody walking along the sidewalk on our side of Union Street is going to walk right into these vehicles. They would have to actually walk out into traffic to get around these trucks. Um, the ladder truck, the ladder truck at, at this point probably still has a few feet back into the station. Um, so even if we wanted to train or wanted to raise the ladder for any type of maintenance, we just couldn't do it from that spot. We have to bring it down to a, a, a different location. Usually the Cavalry Chapel parking lot, they've been, they've been great um, allowing us to uh, utilize their parking lot. Um, so that's the, the kind of the current situation for, for of the current station. And, and I will say if anybody wants to come up and visit, wants a tour, we, we're more than happy to accommodate you with that. You can just reach out um, and call us. You can call me personally. Um, all our contact information is on the town website. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Kelsey now, and she's going to explain um, kind of the conceptual process what we've got uh, and design that we've gotten to. Thank you, Scott. Um, yeah. So I want to preface this presentation from us by saying we are very, very early in the design process. We actually first are going through a phase right now where because this current parcel is in a residential zoning, we need to prepare enough documentation to go before the zoning board and get a special permit to be allowed to use it as a fire station. Um, so right now that's the phase that, that we're in with our work and our consultants. We have a, a civil engineer and a landscape architect and mechanical and electrical engineers on our team right now. Um, but as far as the, the design we have, um, while well, the plan is, has been kind of very thoroughly vetted um, to resolve all of the issues that, that the chief just brought up in his presentation with their current station, um, as far as the exterior design of the building, we have some, some images to kind of help you get a sense of the general massing that it's going to be, but um, by all means, it's not, not a, a done deal, a finished building, and we're, we're very eager to kind of hear feedback from the community um, about ways that the design could be um, improved. So what we have up on the slide is our site plan, which we actually, right before this meeting, had a meeting with um, the zoning board and the planning board um, and some of the, the highway department head in the town, and we've gotten some great comments already that are, that are gonna um, have so, some impacts to the site plan, but what we have is the first floor building footprint, um, where you can see the zone in red are all the areas that are the hot zones um, that the chief was discussing have, you know, the vehicle exhaust and, and hazardous materials um, that are part of the, the job for the firefighters. The orange zones are our warm zones. There are transitional kind of buffer zones that are, that are just for, for the stair and for some corridors to provide an extra layer of separation. And then the blue zones are our, our cool zones where we have next to the apparatus bay, the ready room and the watch room. And then um, our public entrance is right here, kind of at the center of the building off Howard Street, where when you walk in, there'll be a, a generous lobby and the admin offices um, and um, a 100-person training room that I believe will also um, potentially be able to be used by the public for meetings. Um, and we have a parking lot that um, can hold uh, t spaces for 28 vehicles. We have along the Howard Street edge um, some plantings, some street trees, um, and a green space buffer between the building with some low uh, 
bushes around the, the foundation of the building on Howard Street and then on Church Street. We have a 60 foot apron for all the vehicles to be able to pull out fully onto the, um, in front of the building without sticking out into Church Street. Um, we also have one drive-through bay on the site, uh, which allows vehicles, um, specifically the ladder truck, is able to come around and return um, and come around the site and go straight through, uh, which makes returning easier since you don't have to have to back it in. Um, there's also going to be some exterior uh, site equipment, a, a generator to support um, operations of the fire station in the event of a power outage. Um, and a communications t radio tower on the site as well. Um, I can go to the next slide. Um, this is a blow up of the, the floor plan indicating those spaces uh, with the, all, basically everything to uh, the right side of, of here is all of the, the hot zone. Um, with the fire, I think actually the next one is the color-coded version of the plan. Um, the hot zone, where we have now dedicated room for turnout gear lockers, so they're not trying to squeeze next to the, the trucks. Um, wider uh, lanes for all, all of the vehicles, so that there's room to circulate around every vehicle 360. Um, and we're trying to concentrate all of the, the spaces that need to be adjacent to the apparatus bay for fire prevention. Everything um, is close and accessible. And then all of the, the public spaces at the first floor are closer to the entrance. And then we also are providing in this building a separate mechanics bay and mechanics workroom, which um, is not just for servicing vehicle maintenance on the fire department's vehicles, but also other vehicles that the town has in their fleet. Um, and then the next one is just the second floor. So it's only, it's a two-story building. Um, the apparatus bay is uh, kind of going to be a story and a half, roughly, in, in its height, and then, um, which will be, be open. Um, there's the pool for the firefighters to, to get down to the apparatus bay floor. There's also going to be a training mezzanine um, at the bottom edge of the site um, with space also for, for storage. And then everything, um, when you come in the building at the center, there's an elevator and stair for access up. Um, and then there's a public corridor which will have access to the chief office and deputy office um, and some accessory spaces to that. And then everything else on the second floor is the firefighter kind of bunking, uh, kitchen and dining and day room along with um, an outdoor roof terrace for them that is screened and walled off with walls high enough that it's, there's not visibility from the street. Um, and again, this is color-coded to show the, the hot zones that we're keeping. Everything where the firefighters are, are living and eating is separate and away from the apparatus bay. So these were just uh, some um, Google Earth views that we took to show what the, the site looks like currently. It is the old Lincoln School building that is there currently. Um, and it, it extends uh, to where the basketball courts are. Um, and again, this is Howard Street and Church Street. And then the next one is just the view from the opposite side, the back of the, the site. Um, the current building that is on site is, I believe, from the bottom to, to the peak of the roof is actually about 50 feet high, and our building that we're proposing is actually going to end up being, although wider, <laughs> is shorter than the current one, um, and it will be within the 36-foot the allowed zoning height. Um, so these are some uh, very early views of our, our massing. Um, you can see the six doors for the apparatus bay. Um, and then what we wanted to be really mindful of was trying to, to break up this mass so it doesn't feel quite as large on the site and is more responsive to the residential context that it sits within. Um, one of the ways that we did that was we tried to, to push back as much as we could. It is a very kind of narrow site for, for the fire station, but um, we set back from the street as much as 
as we could in the center, and then everything is within the required zoning setback. So these are at least 25 feet from the, the street edge. And then um, we tried to keep everything that was closer to the street a little bit lower. Um, and then breaking up the, the massing with these pitched roofs that provide clear story windows facing north for, to get light into the building with the, the kind of deeper, bigger floor plan. And then this also provides the opportunity, if the town wants to pursue it, for um, solar photovoltaic panels on the roof that are oriented south and optimized for energy production. Um, and you can also see um, a covered parking structure in the parking lot that also has an opportunity for solar. And this is, so this is the view from the back side where um, we have the one drive-through bay. There is a stair training tower, so it's both for access for, to the roof to um, service rooftop equipment. Um, oh, and can also be used by the fire department for firefighter training. Um, we have at the first floor um, the uh, public spaces, and then at the second floor at the back side are the bunk rooms. Um, and there's also the entrance to the mechanics bay at the south end of the site. Um, this was just a perspective view from the corner of Howard and um, Church Street, kind of illustrating what that might look like from an actual human's perspective. Um, but that's it for the materials that we have. So I think we're ready to take questions. And if anyone has a question, step up to the... Oh, yeah. I just wanted to say that um, one thing we neglected to put in the presentation was a timeline. So we're hoping uh, if the Board of Selectmen agree, because only the Board of Selectmen can put something on a, on a ballot, our hope is to have something on the ballot and town meeting this upcoming spring. So the next annual town election in April and the next annual town meeting on May 1st. So that was just one, uh, one timeline point I wanted to note. Uh, and then as Kelsey said, we're, we're ready for questions uh, and hopefully some answers. Um, please come up to the mic, and that's again, while it's not amplified in the room, it's so that folks that watch this recording later uh, can hear what's being asked, um, and we'll do our best to answer your questions. Thank you. more for the chief do we run any risk of uh more finance too for like osha violations for this building that we're currently in like i can see how there's could be occupational payments and osha payments just for the status of the building is that a risk that we run into with this building um it, currently it could be um you know we we keep up on our maintenance we keep on up on our electrical you know we do everything we can to uh mitigate those risks um, we just replaced the floors on the second floor of the current station or, or on half of the, the second floor to get rid of the old asbestos tiles. So with an old building, those risks are always there. We, we do our best to, to mitigate those. Yeah, um, I'm just thinking, like, like, you, like, you show that picture of the walkway between the truck and the yeah, lockers. Like, yeah, a, a, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you start to cram stuff in and, you know, you have open equipment or open storage above a locker, something could fall, strike somebody on the head. Absolutely, those risks are always there. We could hopefully minimize some of those. And there's no funding through DFF, D, uh, DFS at all. <clears throat> there are no, there are, there is no funding through DFS at this time. Uh, as, as Doug said, the, there's many bills that have been proposed to create uh, some type of, of reimbursement, like the schools have. But at this time, no funding sources have been found to support those bills. But yeah, we, we look and we every time. <laughs> Everything, we, we're doing our best. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Evening, Mr. Ward, how are you? Good, Chief, yourself? Good, thank you. John Ward, 22 Nevins Circle. Um, just a couple of questions. The intersections in that area, are they gonna have to be rebuilt to accommodate the um, trucks? That's a, that's a great question. That question was just uh, posed to us uh, by the highway superintendent at our earlier meeting. Uh, at this point, 
we, we, we have to study that. I don't believe that there's going to be um, you know, major reconfigurations. Right. One area that we will have to look at are the lights at East Water and Howard Street. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, what, uh, what will happen to the existing site? That, that's, a, that's a great question. I think Doug can answer that one for us. Thanks, Chief. No, that's a, that's a great question. Um, that would be up to the Board of Selectmen uh, to make some decisions. Um, just very preliminarily, my recommendation to the Board would be that we propose to town meeting uh, an article to dispose of the property, to sell it, to have it uh, redeveloped with a uh, private developer, maybe some type of mixed use or other you know, purely commercial use. So the idea would be to sell it uh, you know, get some funding, you know, for the sale, and then I put it on the tax rolls. That, that would be my recommendation, but again, that would be up to the Board of Selectmen and ultimately town meeting to decide. I see. Thank you. Um, I serve in the Board of Library Trustees. That property is right next door to the library. Currently, we're working on a strategic plan for the future uh, of the library, and that site uh, would be invaluable to the library, which right now is in desperate need of space. Um, but you know, this is, um, I'm sure we're gonna have further discussions about this down the road. Um, a ballpark number I heard was $20 million. I, I just wanna be clear, that was me just putting a rough number out there just so people kinda of get a sense of scale. You know, the, uh, the school project, um, which is obviously substantially larger than, than what we're looking at here. Uh, the initial estimates uh, that voters voted was $86 million. The actual bids came in significantly lower, 10 to $12 million under budget. Um, so, but that was, that was all bid out before the economy went upside down with COVID and supply chain problems and labor increases. But again, that's a, school's a massive building. This is substantially smaller. I put 20 million in, just something that's you know maybe in the ballpark, but w we don't have an exact number yet. As we as we continue working, the architects will hire a cost estimator and they'll do some of that work. Did you want to add something? Yeah, our our plan is to we um, engage our cost estimator before it goes to the town meeting and and town vote, so that they'll be. A, a, it'll be an early estimate, but there'll be contingency built in, and you guys will have a number um, for for voting. I see. Have Have you seen uh, any similar size fire stations built in the last few years? Uh, any idea what those costs might have run? I think not post pandemic. So uh. it, everything's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So costs costs have gone up. We don't, unfortunately. We don't know the number yet. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Mr. Rodolph, how are you? Hi. Thank Good you evening. For coming. Jack Rodolph, 297 Howard Street. Um, there's no doubt that another fire station is needed. Uh, and as being a neighbor, would I prefer this? No. But it, it might be inevitable that it's going to be here. But one, I think one would want, the, or ideally, for the fire station to be in harmony with the residential buildings around it. Like some of the fire stations, uh, there's, I think, one down in Duxbury or Kingston, and, e and even um, the fire station over in Hanover. And such as, we have what appears to be brick, uh, such as if you had like hardy plank, cement clapboards or something, have some kind of residential, appearance of a residential design because right now this is like you you drop this in this neighborhood and it's like an albatross it is completely foreign to everything that's here and it and it's it cannot help but devalue the neighborhood um, and um, i mean that's that, that's that's my point so yeah no it, it, and it's a very good point uh mr rodolph i you know I live right down the street myself, um, and what the architects have done at this point, where you're seeing this massing, it's extremely preliminary. It's you know a first shot at you know just getting something to present. No materials have been picked out. No exterior design. You know uh, we are taking into account you know the, the area. 
um, the sandpaper factory. The factory that used to be at, at 324 Howard Street that was currently torn down. You know, they were trying, trying to take some architectural um, characteristics of, of, of the neighborhood and everything around to incorporate it into this. Um, the telephone building on Webster Street's all brick. You know, we're, we're trying to blend it with, with the whole area. Um, you know, the clear stories, some of the, some of the massing, um, not that dissimilar from the Stratus condos at 42 Church Street. So I, it, I, think, I think really a fire station, uh, it could only improve um, the neighborhood than what's currently there and what currently could end up there. <clears throat> uh, you know, the, the points are all uh, well put. But it really doesn't, it has no real resemblance whatsoever in this type of, and I know that changes can be made, but the, but the point I'm trying to make is that to have the full support of people in the area and or perhaps other town meeting members, that, that to have, it can be done, uh, to have something that is, that instead of just having a little something here, but a brick building in a residential neighborhood such as this, there's no brick buildings. And as I said, with the clapboards, and I'm throwing that as, as an example, and at least I'm, glad, I'm happy to see that there's no red, red uh, doors for the uh, overhead doors. But um, that was a point I was gonna make. Yeah. But uh, um, if, if some concerted effort could be put into that, it, and and it might not entail any extra money, and if it does, it would probably be worth it. And, and I'm gonna pass this to the architects because, you know, as Kelsey said, starting this, that's the input that we're looking for, and that's the input but, as the process goes that is, is, is important to us. And, and we do have them, like as I said, in Hanover and down in mm -hmm. Duxbury, and I believe Kingston has one. Yeah. And uh, I, I but, think for, for, for us, the, 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 in, in terms of a, a, an approach to- you can't, well, I don't think this amplifies. Uh, uh, no, it's, it's, it's for the, uh, no, I just need, I just need to talk louder, that's all. Um, in terms of a process at getting at a fire station in the neighborhood, we have to start with first, uh, what meets the needs of the fire department? Second, how can we make that footprint as efficient as possible? No one wants a larger fire station on the site than is absolutely needed. And then we're looking at things like raw massing. So what is the bulk of the thing and how can we help break it down a little bit so that it's not as apparently large as it could appear. Uh, may, may and I then we get to materials and I think you're absolutely right. We're still, we're still looking at but materials. And and the, I mean, it can, it can be done. So yeah. it, it, the, only, the only matter is whether it's gonna cost more dollars or less dollars, but um, but for the, whatever the additional dollars would yeah. be. I mean, it, it's like, I, I've often made comparisons of something such as this as a person, as a male wearing a $3,000 Armani suit then has white socks on. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's basically what it is. It's like, you know, this is, it's not in harmony with the neighborhood. Yeah. And, and, and you don't, and all I'm emphasizing is that I think that this is very important, and I think mm -hmm. that other people will, will think it's important. So when you go back to the drafting table, or the, your CAD, mm -hmm. that if, if this is something that you give thought, thought to in a strong right, effort, right. as opposed to, I know it can be done because I've mm -hmm. done enough construction myself. It is feasible, so it's the, but you have to have the desire first. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, it's okay. I'm Lori Childs, 234 North Avenue. Um, I have a few questions. Does any of the soil need to be remediated on this property? Do you know? So as, as part of this phase of study, we had Green, Green Environmental um, do a, a preliminary soil testing. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, there is nothing in the test pits that, that were tested that came out that flagged anything, okay. which, which, is, which is nice because yeah. of the, 
the old Plymouth rubber that used to be up um, right, yeah. where the Stratus condos are now. Yeah, um, do you know how deep the plug tests were? I do not. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> And I, this is just a comment rather than a question, but I was talking to um, one of the people on the select board in Stoughton, and pre-pandemic for a similar fire station, they paid about 27 million. So, and they did well. part bonding and then part, you know, mm. taxing. So, and then <clears throat> my last question, let's see, what was it? Um, oh, menopause, excuse me. <laughs> so, um, oh yeah, um, I just wanted to talk budget because what I hear from everybody is like, we can't afford that, we're paying for a new school, let's pay off the school first, then do a fire station, which would mean kicking the fire station can down the road. Um, so, um, in order to have, you know, this, or uh, what if they voted down at town meeting is my question. What are the costs associated with the current station? And over a number of years, I, I would guess that might add up to more than a new station would cost currently. Sure, I don't know what costs you know we'd be facing to to make repairs and, and needed repairs at the current station and some renovations. I'm, I'm sure we would have to have uh, you know some type of architectural study to assist us with. What really needs to get done yeah. with that? With okay, that so that's a, that's a cost. That's there's, a cost. There's you know, cu customizing uh, the fire trucks to fit into a smaller station is you can pay up to what two hundred fifty thousand five hundred per. The the, per the last the last truck that? that we just ordered was six hundred seventy five thousand dollars. Right. Um, a lot of that had customization on it to keep it narrow to keep it allow Correct. us to back it into the current station. Right. Any new apparatus, if we went for a new ladder truck, I couldn't even imagine. If they, they, if they even designed one that would fit in there now. Correct. Back so, in 99, they had to put it on a special chain, crane chassis to fit it into the station. Right. That was an extra cost. So in considering the, for residents to consider whether to do a station at all, a town meeting and on the ballot, um, this is something to consider. Are all of these extra costs that accumulate from being in a station that's too small? Correct. And, so and, this might end up being a cheaper option. And what happens if we do delay it? <laughs> Um, and we yeah. do, you know, right. what, what are those construction costs going to be in four years, six years? Five percent a year. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I mean, five five percent a year right now is a conservative estimate, so the cost is not going to go down. Yeah. So anyway, okay, that's it. Yeah. My umbrella. I got a couple of questions um, because mainly the biggest issue that we have is this should have been a debt exclusion before the school ever was a debt exclusion. That's just my opinion, but we're the people that are paying for this. And you gotta, gotta help us here with a creative way of paying for this. Because yes, you need, a, we need a fire, new fire station. The old one just, it, it's too small, the works. I want a new fire station, but I have to be able to afford it. And everyone else has to be able to afford it. And I also have to be able to afford knocking down the old one I have to be, and remediating underneath your floor. I'm not sure that's been completely done. Um, and we need to afford the fact that you're going to need new fire trucks down the line. So there's got to be a creative way every single year to take something from free cash to start paying off and not and take the burden off of the homeowner with a debt exclusion because it's just one thing right after the other and a hundred and fifty six thousand dollars a hundred and fifty six hundred dollars a year extra I don't think anyone can afford the hundred and fifty six thousand they'll all move out um, that's a high price it, there's got to be I saw on on your plan you have officer quarters but then you have open areas for the regular firemen but now with COVID I'm not sure if you need to have some kind of partitions and then you're going to need to have a, a, a open space for future in case you increase your firemen so what is it that you can live without or what can you live with pared down 
and, but has room for future expansion so that it brings the cost way down for us for something that we could say, okay. And then there's got to be something on the town side that, you know, if there's an overlap uh, uh, of people working, I don't mean fire and police and so on and so forth, but if there's an overlap, can, you, can we do without for a while and then get back to increasing um, government, that type thing. Is that possible? Maybe I'll start on the financing, and thank you for the question, Mary. Um, part of why I took the time to put those slides in the beginning about financing, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and the need for a debt exclusion is just to, to put it right out there and just to be completely honest and transparent. We will continue to look for any grant opportunity that's available, but as we said, there is no fire station building program in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It doesn't exist. It's going to require a debt exclusion. It's just the reality of the situation. As with any debt exclusion, it's an authorization to borrow. So if, we, um, if it passes and some miraculous new bill passes and there's some new program that we're eligible for, then we can transition that funding midstream. But I want to just be realistic. I'm not going to blow smoke and tell people, oh, we're going to figure out some other creative ways. It's going to require a ballot vote. It's going to require a debt exclusion. We can certainly look at whether we can supplement paying for debt service with free cash, as you suggested. That's obviously taxpayer funding, too, so that's not free, uh, even though they call it free cash. It's, it's a funny thing with the State yeah, Department of Revenue, but we all know it's taxpayer funding. Um, but the downside to that is we rely on free cash to buy equipment and to do to make all other kinds of important improvements in the community. So it's, you know, it's one pocket or the other. But I just I want to be honest with everyone, and that's why we took the time to put it out there. While we're looking at grants, a project of this size and scale is going to require a debt exclusion. Uh, I'll, I'll let the chief and the architects talk about how modest a structure this can be. I'll, I'll defer to them, but I can assure you that while we're looking at the needs of the building, right, that like. We don't want to cut off our nose to spite our face and spend millions of dollars on something that within a very short period of time is going to be inadequate or too small. We want to have something that's going to last, right. have a little bit of room for growth, but still be you know, modest and reasonable and not, you know, not too much. And that's, that's why we have professional architects and, and other engineers working with the team to try to make it as economical and efficient as possible. And, and that also relates to the previous gentleman's point about exterior materials. You know, they're going to look at every option to keep costs down. I can assure you that. Chief, do you want to talk about the maybe staffing of the station? And so currently, currently we're staffed seven personnel per shift. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's the on-duty shift. That's the 24-hour shift. Um, the current design for the building which, you know, we, like as Doug said, we want something that's going to last, a 100-year building, something that, you know, in 40 years, the next fire chief isn't going to say, well, what were they thinking back then? Right. Um, the current size is for a staffing of 40 personnel. So that would be um, 10 per shift mm -hmm. um, instead of seven. I think anything over than that, we'd be, you know, we'd be having to look at substations and something like that. That's probably not going to be something I will see in my lifetime. I would love to see it. Hopefully we will with grants. But um, so that's what we're staffed at. We are also what we took into account, and this is um, lessons learned from other fire stations built, are the chiefs within Plymouth County. Oh, yeah. The minute they've opened up, the minute they've opened their doors, geez, you know, we wish we had a couple extra closets. Wish we had, um, you know, just a, we had a spare office. Um, those, those are things that we have taken into consideration. You know, um, if it came down to if we had to trim, which, you know, we're not even, we're not at that time yet. Um, if we had to trim, you know, we, we would have to seriously look at, at, at stuff um, in those areas. That's my point. Can you build a sh out a shell, okay, that's thinking in the future, you're going to have space that's needed, but right now, it's and, wide open. And that is exactly what's, what's happening. The, the, the bunk rooms that are being constructed, you know, not every bunk room is going to be full, uh, but there will be space for um, the future. There will be, you know, people will be spread out, um, you know, and again, like you said with COVID, um, there will be petitions, there'll be curtains, you know, it'll be, um, you know, um, gender compatible. Um, 
you know, not everybody's going to be crammed in the same rooms to sleep. Um, and that's been taken into account in this station, but also there has been room, you know, room to expand um, for the future. We, that, that it has been done. So if, if you could start out with the bare bones and bring that price tag way down, because we're paying a lot. We're paying for two schools, <laughs> senior center, $12 million in, in road debt exclusion, and yet there's some roads that aren't even touched. And that's the, the, the whole problem is we're paying for all of this, and, and there's more to come, and, and it's just you can only go to the well so many times. Absolutely. And, Mary, as you know, I'm, I'm a lifelong resident. I'm, yep. I'm paying the exact I know. Same. You were at the birthday parties I'm, at I, my house. I was, you know, since I was five. So yep. <laughs> it's, you know, I'm paying the exact taxes. I feel it. I'm, I'm seeing it myself. So I understand and I, I sympathize. I empathize with that. It's, uh, it's unfortunate that over the past 80 years yeah. that everything's been kicked down the road. That yeah. can's been kicked in this town for a long time. And un unfortunately, uh, we're paying the bill for that. And, and I don't, and I don't, uh, uh, I don't um, agree with, the, with that happen. But unfortunately, we, we are paying the bill for, for the can being kicked down the road. And I don't want to kick any more cans down the roads for, for future residents. Thank you. Hi, Jackie Tiso, 455 Webster Street. I just want to make a comment, and then I have a question that probably can't be answered tonight, but I want to kind of put it out there. First of all, I have to tell you my reaction to seeing these pictures of the fire station. I'm outraged. Outraged that you guys are working in those conditions. And when we hear about carcinogens and toxicity and all of that exposure, my gut goes back to, because I know my own financial situation, how you guys ended up behind the building of a giant school. I'm going to tell you, my house was built in 1849. The last update to that was in 1970. Every single time we have a debt exclusion and my property taxes go up, it gets tacked onto my mortgage. I can't afford to do anything with my house because I'm scrambling to keep up with these costs. Again, I support you guys 100%. I don't understand how this fire station could have gotten kicked down the road in place of a school. Your health and safety, as far as I'm concerned, was more important. My only question that I have, which is not answerable right now, and when we're talking about kicking cans down the road, we also have a sewer plant that frightens me in terms of the cost that it's going to take to bring that into compliance. So what are we thinking? So thank you. First, yeah, I'm going to pass this to Doug. But first, thank you very much for your support. We do appreciate it. And um, again, my mortgage Thank you for your comments, Jackie. I do uh, appreciate them. Um, in general, you know, this question's come up about, you know, why did the school happen when it did or something else happening later? As projects are ready and are brought forward, they get considered by the board and, and the board decides whether to put it before voters or not. So, uh, for example, with sewer, um, you're right. There are great needs in the town for improvements at the sewer plant and the collection system. The sewer commissioners have not put forward a request yet. Well, I, know you're, I know you're shaking your head, but they, there's, there's not been a request yet to put anything before voters. So um, when that time comes, the board will carefully consider that and decide whether to put it before voters or not. I think that for a sewer plant, there will be more opportunities for grant funding than there are for fire stations. Um, but in general, to answer your question, um, as things are ready, they get brought before the board, the board reviews them, and then decides whether to put them before voters or not. And there was, um, as, they, as they come in, they get evaluated and get presented. That, that's really the only way I can kind of answer that question. Um, but you are right, and Mary was right as well. There are other projects coming. Um, we have sewer needs, uh, and we also need a new community center, and that's another feasibility study um, that we're working on as well. Uh, because the McKinley Center, um, the McKinley School has issues too. So that's right, and as things are ready to be presented, and ultimately, I hear you loud and clear about your ability to afford things, and the beauty of our form of government is none of us get to decide whether this happens or not. It's voters that, have, that make the decision. It's voters and taxpayers that decide.
Donald, sure. Donald Can, could you put this slide on showing the um, the aerial view? Uh, no, of the of the, the station the, or of Don of the station or of this um, this one. Yes. I have no argument with the need of a, of a new fire station, and I can't tell you from my uh, knowledge whether we're, you're advocating a Cadillac or a Buick uh, in, in a type of thing. You certainly have a lot of things going. My problem with the, with the, the fire station is it's in a, in a residential uh, neighborhood. You can see it plainly in this site. All our planning documents, starting with zoning, work to enhance neighborhoods uh, and, and this, this takes away from that. Our latest uh, document said, for instance, that we should have in all neighborhoods a park or a playground. We have a little playground here. That's going to be gone. So to me, it's an adverse effect. And just in a question with, with it, we wouldn't allow a trucking company here under zoning, and we wouldn't allow an ambulance company here. We wouldn't allow any type of uh, a nearby industrial zone having noise other than the working hours from, let's say, 9 to 5 o'clock in, in the afternoon. I think that perhaps if you add $20 million, that's a, a good guesstimate for this fire station. I don't have a problem with that either. But if you add a few hundred thousand more, maybe you can buy a piece of land in a main street, on a main street, in a more commercial or industrial area to do this. I think there's an opportunity with the Lincoln School. By the way, we have uh, one of our planning and, and enhancing uh, documents is the CPA, and there's money for historical preservation. We took an old building like that that hadn't been used for years, We've got it on the National Register, even though the, the, the uh, Finance Committee put forth $10,000 to tear it down. It's used as the uh, headquarters for North River Collaborative, the Arms House. Before they did it, it was closed. There were pigeons there, most of them dead, some without he heads. We fixed it up. It's still an asset it's in, in the town. The Lincoln School, I, I think, uh, gives an opportunity to uh, add to our uh, percentage on, um, on 40B. Uh, after all, a quite smaller school is being done in, at Holy Family. If you sell the Lincoln School and you start collecting taxes from it, you enhance the neighborhood, and you uh, may be able to take the money of saving and, and, and raising the building sale price and taxes to uh, offset the cost of some other piece of land for a fire station. So thank you, Don. Oh, can I? question. Well, before you ask that question, can, I, fire, can I address the, what you just said first? The fire department no? has a, um, <laughs> a whistle when they call fire people out. Do they? Do you expect to use that whistle in this uh, neighborhood? So I don't. I'll, I'll, I'll address being a good neighbor, but I want Don yeah. to answer your first Let question. me answer the first part, and then I'll turn it over to the chief. Um, first, as far as the use goes, I would argue um, emergency. Sure. I would argue that you know fire response, EMS response, is different from other industrial uses. This is a critical municipal life safety service. And so I don't think it's fair to really come. So I'm just saying that that's why it's that's why it's different from those other uses. The next thing is one of the first things um, the chief did with me when I first got here about three and a half years ago was we were looking aggressively at other areas of town. We looked a lot down at the end of Union Street at Market Street where the old Rite Aid was and where the Cavalry Church is. And we approached landowners. We we tried to look at acquiring potentially acquiring other land. They're not selling. And eminent domain is not something we're interested in pursuing at this time. Um, even if we were to find some other site that is willing to sell, which there isn't one, but even if there was, it's only going to cost more. And getting to Mary's point about getting the project cost down, that's driving the cost of the project up. So the simple point is there's no other site in town that's in the right location, because location is key, 
because if it's not in the right location, then we're looking at building a second station, which will cost a lot more permanently because we have to hire more firefighters to staff a second station, and that's a, that those are permanent cost increases. So I just wanted to make it clear, we didn't include it as part of this presentation, but that analysis of looking at other sites, that's been beaten to death from our end, and there's really no other suitable site that would allow us to operate out of only one station, which is the most efficient way to operate in town, that the site just, there's no other town-owned parcel or privately owned parcel that we can acquire that, that is in the right location and is the right size. And maybe with that, I'll turn it to the chief about the siren. Thanks, Doug. So, Mr. Can, it's a great question about the, the whistle, the, the fire whistle. Um, as a kid growing up with it, I loved it. I always knew to run in, turn the scanner on, and then hop on my bike to wherever I needed to, to go watch the, the firefighters. Um, <clears throat> I hope that the current fire station where we are now, I, I, I hope we're good neighbors to, um, you know, the, the residences right in the back behind the library, the, the rice block. But, um, you know, uh, my promise to the, to the Church Street, Howard Street uh, residents are, is that we want to be good neighbors. If we are fortunate enough to have a fire station built at that location, um, unfortunately, we would not bring the whistle. We would not bring the horn with us. Um, a, as much as it's great notification for the town and you know, just to let people know that we're going on, for a residential setting, it, it definitely, um, it's, it's not warranted. We know that. Um, when I started my fire career permanently, I started uh, on the Norwell Fire Department. Um, we had the fire station that's on Washington Street by the old TGI Fridays by the Fours Restaurant. Um, <clears throat> when you leave that fire station, from that fire station all the way up to past the, the Ford's restaurant, it's Farrah Farm Drive, that's a no siren zone. That was be the fire department being good neighbors, you know, not to use the sirens and horns um, within that area. We would definitely do the same thing um, within the, the, the Church Street, Howard Street neighborhood. Um, again, I'm right on Stanton Street. The, the station is, is a, almost exactly a quarter of a mile from my house. So again, as much as, as, much as, as I'm at the station, I don't want to hear sirens all, all day, all night either. Um, so again, we would have those set up, you know, use sirens only when necessary. Um, you know, th there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's the Plymo vent fan at the fire station that's extremely loud. You know, new, newer technologies, hopefully they can, you know, decrease the decibels of that. But again, the whole goal, while we're training and, you know, while we're responding, the, the whole goal is, is to just blend in with the neighborhood and be good neighbors. So hopefully that answers your question. Good evening. Kathleen Boyd, 343 Concord Street certainly in support of a new fire station. Um, just a question about the number of bays and the apparatus that we currently have, and I'm assuming that you've uh, studied and considered if there are any needs to increase the number of apparatus that we have, and will those bays that are part of the plan accommodate any of that growth that you may or may not need. Yeah, great question, thank you. So currently we have six bays at the fire station. Four of those bays are single bays. Two of them are a bay and a half. That's at the current one. Um, the designed as designed would have six almost double bays. So we would be able to, we, we'd be able to accommodate our current equipment. And then if we were fortunate enough to um, have a spare, a spare engine, say, uh, we would be able to accommodate within, within this design, okay. yes. Okay, right. thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, can you speak to a little about response time and how mm -hmm. that builds into all of this and why this site might be a good choice yeah. from that perspective. Thank you, Lori. So when we first started looking at constructing a fire station, we had um, multiple sites we were looking at. Um, the McKinley School, 
the Lincoln School, the current station, um, as, as Doug said, the, the, the Rite Aid site. We hired a um, consultant, uh, a fire operations consultant, to study the town, to look at our response times. He took our, our existing data, our, our historical data, um, entered it into his fancy software, and then also mapped out the whole town. Um, <clears throat> currently, our response times are, aren't getting any shorter. They're actually getting longer as there's more traffic. Um, obviously, Home Depot, Pond Street area, it takes a little bit longer to get to. Beach Street, it gets a little bit longer to get to. What was good about the Lincoln School site and what he stated in his report is that the response times are identical to the current fire station. They want the close enough that, that you can assume that they're the same. So our response times throughout the town wouldn't change, which, which is a huge advantage for us and a huge advantage for the residents. Um, you know, really the only way to improve response times would to be construct, to construct a second station, a substation. <clears throat> if we were to do that, um, we, we would have to put on additional firefighters to staff that station. <clears throat> we wouldn't necessarily have to double our staffing, but we'd definitely have to hire at least probably four or five personnel per shift. So I'd be another 16 to 20 firefighters uh, within the town to staff a station. <clears throat> I don't see building a fire station, um, we're just going to say the northeast end of town down by the hotels. I don't see staffing a fire station down there with two personnel only. The minute if you know, they took an ambulance, the minute they transported, that station would be empty for an hour, hour and a half. That was a system that I came from in Norwell. And while the town of Norwell um, <clears throat> utilizes that system, and, and it's been a, a system they've had forever, I would not want to see the, the town of Rockland have a false sense of security having a, an empty fire station within one of the areas of town for that amount of time. Therefore, you would need more personnel four personnel per fire station. Um, and then also, we cross-staff our, our apparatus, our trucks. So <clears throat> the ambulance crew. Well, the ambulance crew is in, in quarters. If they're not at the hospital and we get a call for a fire, one of, they, they hop on the ladder truck and they take the ladder truck as well as the ambulance. So we, we cross-staff all our apparatus depending upon what call comes in. We really run it bare bones. Um, a lot of fire departments, they don't do that. They, they have you know, three or four people per ladder truck, three or four people per, per engine, the two or three people per the ambulance. Unfortunately, we don't have the staffing to do that. So everybody's dual trained and, and we, we make it work. We make it work pretty well for the town. We're, we're not different from any other uh, department in our area. Um, it's just how we operate in this part of the country. So if we were to take personnel from our current station, if we were to keep our staffing the same and put it in a substation, the ability to cross staff apparatus and to make sure the proper equipment gets to an incident isn't, isn't available to us anymore. So, um, <clears throat> so sorry, Laurie, but to get back, yes, the, the, the current site is, is maintains our current our response patterns, essentially, and our response times throughout the town. Hi, Jessica Berarda, 74 Church Street. I'm all for, I get we need a new fire station. I, don't, I support that fully. My question is, I'm guessing that's probably been studies done of what happens when a fire station moves into a residential area, pros and cons versus property values, people wanting to live there, not wanting to live there. <coughs> Have you done any research on those studies? Anything you could share with us about the pros and cons of what happens when a fire station? That's information I have not seen, but yeah. The only insurance information I've seen is that the closer you are to hydrants, the closer you are to emergency services, generally um, the better insurance is rated. And I, I, I'm not aware of studies that show that it's a detriment to the community, but that's certainly something we can look at more and be, be better prepared to answer at the next session. Yeah, I just am be curious about property values. I mean, if, you know, if it's going to go down, then at least the town could take notice of that, maybe not tax the ones of us that live really close by as much. <laughs> Wouldn't be bad. but. That was my main question. Thanks. I just want to ask probably the same question. 
what our street are you going to use when you're going out on a call? Is oh. it going to be Church Street, or is it going to be Howard Street, so, or is it going to be oh, Webster oh, Street, oh, East Water Street? So cu currently, the, the design of the station has the apparatus moving out onto Church Street. Church Street. Um, depending upon the call in town is where the apparatus are going to go. My guess is, uh, you know, our main routes that we're going to want to get to, you know, Union Street, Webster Street, East Water Street are our main arteries right. and Market Street. So those are the main arteries that we're going to go, either a left up church up to the top of Union Street um, or take a right, go to Howard, either, either to East Water Market or to um, Webster Street. Okay, because, yeah, Union Street coming out from the center is far different than coming out in residential areas. And Correct. East Water Street, Church Street, Howard Street, and Webster Street, they're all residential. We I mean, Union Street, where I live, I'm used to you coming by. Right. In, in current, currently, you know, obviously we use, we use Union Street. Um, our, our, I would say our second main artery in, that we use for response is Webster Street, um, all the way from, from Webster all the way to the Hanover line. Webster to Hingham is probably our secondary, you know, main right, response right. artery. And then obviously Union to Market Street would be you know, our, 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 our next busiest um, currently with, with our current station. So, I don't know. You, you're going by my house every day and multiple times. Lately. As much as we go by your yeah. house. Well, just, you know, the ambulance is on the way to the hospital by your house. Um, as much as we go by your house every day, there's probably uh, houses that we go by even more. Debbie King, Hi. Webster Street. I Hi. got a bunch of quick questions and suggestions. Um, could you get the two houses on East Water Street and make it a, a you know, pull through? So you, you, so you, so you have your equipment back to back. Why don't you have garage doors on each side of it? Is there no space to do it at this time? It's y yes. So we, we are constrained by the site and the architects and Kelsey and Stuart can probably answer this much better than I can, but for the main reasons that we have the design now is we're constrained to a narrow site, yes. Uh, my other question was, um, I saw a, a cell tower in there somewhere. <clears throat> so it's not, a, it's not a cell tower. Okay. It's a, it's, it would be a communications tower. Um, we don't know which height it would be but our main radio operations is, is from our fire station, um, our, our main radio repeater throughout the whole town. Um, if you look at the current station, we have a, t a tower on the station itself. Mm -hmm. We would have to replicate that and try and maintain the, a similar height. Um, when it comes to radios, height is um, king. It's the higher you are, the better your radio reception. I was just wondering if we could rent it out to other people and make some money on it. So <laughs> that's, that, that's an awesome question. In, and Mr. Lapp, uh, you know, we, we, he and I had discussed this, and I was like, don't say that. They're not going to want to see, you know, <laughs> rate, uh, microwaves on the towers. Yeah, but if, we, if, if, it's a, if it's a source of revenue, then obviously we could look at it as long as it doesn't um, bother the neighbors. Excellent. Um, what was the other question? Um, there was no possibility of the uh, living towers going over the bay and having like a shorter space and more stuff around it? I'm going to let or, Kelsey answer I mean, I'm sure it's probably not good for you to be over We're it. We're really trying to keep the station within the zoning boundaries and, and one of those requirements being a height limitation. Certainly with the goal of not overpowering the neighborhood, uh, trying to keep this building as low as possible is critical. Right. And the exhaust for the um, bay, that won't be anywhere near the um, living quarters now? No. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, Sorry. Um, yeah, we'll have um, the latest and greatest PlymoVent systems in our apparatus bay um, that are exhausting up. And we actually, I wanted to add that we, we did, had actually studied a layout where um, we looked at stacking the, the bunking over the apparatus bay to try to shrink the footprint, but the reality of it was that um, what's shown, almost everything that's shown on the first floor here really wants to be on the first floor. So even if we move stuff around at the second level, there wasn't much shrinking of the actual footprint at the, at the ground. 
Will the windows open? Will they be able to open the windows to get cool air in there? I hope so. Okay. Yeah. We've, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, best practices for energy conservation would suggest no, oh. and that fresh air is introduced through the mechanical systems in the building. Okay. Um, yeah. shoot, I got a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Um, I found, I did find some grants out there that are just starting, but they won't give you the money if it's already an existing product, project. So for the U.S., there's a one in U.S. Congress right now, uh, H.R. 3728, um, and it has to do with FEMA and how, um, being able to, uh, give funds to towns for police stations, fire stations, mm -hmm. everything for uh, first responders and things like that. And that has, right now has 37 co-sponsors. Unfortunately, it, uh, it's stalled in uh, 2021, mm -hmm. but I don't know if we could call people and bug them and get them to push it for, forward. That would be good. Um, that one's offering a maximum of 7.5 million. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm for the grant. And then there's another Massachusetts grant that looks a little bit more promising. Um, that one, a bunch of people uh, wanted it. So they merged that all to um, bill number S2971. And it looks like they're gonna try to make a, um, a public safety building uh, department. And they're gonna take 1% of the sales tax to fund that in Massachusetts. And right now it um, was favored and it's in the, oh, what did I write? Um, it's in the uh, Senate and Ways and Means Committee. So I don't know how long it takes after that, but that happened in July of 2022. So that's a little bit more promising. And unfortunately, I don't, I don't know if that, I don't know the maximum on that. I didn't see it in the bill. No, that's great. I appreciate you doing your homework. That's, that's really excellent. I, unfortunately, um, a lot of bills have been pending for many, many, many years. And so th there's a lot of yeah. bills out there, but a bill doesn't do us any good. It has to be law. It has to be an actual program in existence. And we'll, we will continue to pursue anything that's available. Do you guys know how long it takes to do a bi get a bill through? I'm not sure. I, I just started looking it, at it. It all depends. You know, something can happen in six months, right? Or sometimes... Things languish for years and years and never get adopted. It's the legislative process. So it's right. the, so the well, issue isn't the length of time. It's the political support and the ability to fund the program that's been holding it up in the legislature. Okay. Well, we'll do a letter writing campaign to all the people that can give it to us. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? Oh, great. Dan Landy, 40 Linwood Terrace. Um, I'm looking at all the bays and everything you have, and I am assuming that in 78, when they did the addition, they based that on residency population in the town. Is any of this based on residency, and are there any state or federal requirements as to what you should have for a, a fire station? So we based, we based the station on the growth of the town, the growth of the fire station. Um, we had, uh, his name was Bob Mitchell. He was, uh, he did the programming for the, for the fire station. He's a, an award-winning um, fire station designer architect. Um, he's built fire stations from coast to coast. And he, and, and he worked um, with Schwartz and Silver as architect to help us program this. And um, we use best practices and what we felt was going to be needed with this station. And as I said, um, the station's built to accommodate 40 firefighters on shift. So essentially that's where we were at. And, and, and we feel that any more than that, we'd be looking at a substation anyway. Um, I certainly hope in 1978 when they did the, um, the addition, they, they did take that into account. I'm not too sure. So, um, and I forgot the second half of your question. I'm sorry. State or federal oh, so, <clears throat> um, so obviously there, there's OSHA, there's Mass, there's um, Department of Labor Standards, and there's the National Fire Protection Agency, NFPA, and and they all have their recommendations, their standards, the diesel capture systems, um, and that is all going to be taken into account. 
Um, and obviously the big one, the Massachusetts State Building Code is really gonna be the driving factor. Yeah. All right, any, any other questions? I just wanna say, and actually before I go on to my closing comments, do anybody else from the building committee that's here have any comments you folks would like to make? And any, any other comments from, from us up here? I just wanna say this really exceeded my expectations for attendance and participation. We really, really appreciate it. Um, while I'm not taking notes on paper right now, I'm gonna be watching the video and, and writing up notes of all the questions and, and we will take all of this um, very seriously into consideration as we continue moving forward. We hope to have more public outreach um, and we'll see where we go from here. But I wanna thank you all for taking the time tonight to come and engage so much. We really appreciate it. One, one last oh, thing, if you, know, you go home and you think of a question or if you think of something, a, a comment or, or something that's gonna help us, um, you know, help us with the, the future design of the station, please email me or call, or call me. Um, Again, the town of Rockland, if you go to the, the, the fire department's uh, contact website, my, my email is right there and the, the number to the station is. Or if you just want to walk up to the station and, and stop in and say hello, always welcome. I'll give you a tour and, uh, you know, we can, we can chat about uh, your recommendations. So, again, thank you very much.